and one of our great rising stars already in the fashion world. His, it, it, it was quoted, if you have his, uh, I, I handed out to you all of this. Read it well because, by the way, make sure you take notes of every guest speaker because your final multiple choice exam will have many of the questions will be part of what the guest speakers have conveyed to you. Uh, Hilton Hollis, as I said, is a graduate of this school with a degree in fashion design. He's a native of Natchez, Mississippi. And you know, I'm in love with the South, so you should know that. Uh, his love of fashion was inspired by his grandmother. I'm going to make this brief because you have all the uh, wonderful information on the flyer I gave you. And while he was a guest speaker here, like you all will be exposed, he met many of our famous designers like Dana Buckman, John Bartlett, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, they all told me how talented he is. After graduation, I think he worked for both of them as an intern or help. And this is very important part of this class. Uh, his dream was to open his own company and two years ago his dream was realized. And that's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, his success is a result of his quiet confidence and passion for perfection. This makes him a present in our fashion world today and the future. He will grow and grow and be one of our great, great names. And I will not talk anymore. I want you to come and take the podium. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what I did to actually get to FIT. Um, as Alice said, I grew up in Mississippi on, um, she didn't say this, but I'm going to tell you, she, I grew up on a farm uh, in Mississippi, 350-acre farm with a 28-acre lake far, far away from New York fashion. Um, I never realized how um, my journey could actually take place until I got to New York and came to FIT. Um, FIT has, had really given me uh, a great basis uh, to launch my career in the world of fashion. Um, FIT is a fantastic place to learn the business, uh, learning the basics here, and applying yourself is very, very important. Um, I employ all of you to be proactive while you're here. Any opportunities that you see coming your way, I employ you to take those opportunities to the utmost degree. Um, you know, while I was here, I actually got involved in um, a lot of different fashion show events. One was in um, Portofino, Italy, which was the Mandarina Duck competition in uh, 2000. Uh, actually, in 1999, it was the Millennium Celebration for Mandarina Duck in Portofino. Um, any opportunities that you have like this that you are presented with, I really ask you to take those opportunities and to really apply yourself and put every, you know, every effort forward uh, to make those opportunities a reality. Um, after FIT, and I graduated in 1999, after FIT, I actually worked for Dana Buckman. Um, I was on Dana's design staff for about a year and a half. Um, and I actually met Dana here at FIT, as Alice said. Um, I went up to her after, the, uh, after her speech, and I actually introduced myself. And she was a Memphis native, which is, you know, next door to Mississippi. So that was a great opportunity for me to get my name in her head. Um, I think that's so important. Every time you guys come to one of these events, um, you should really come down, take an opportunity to meet the designers. I'm not asking that all of you come down. I'm just saying to you, it would probably be a good idea to. Um, you know, I'm not Oscar de la Renta, but one day I hope to be as big as he is. Um, but if Oscar de la Renta was here today, I would be down here after the event speaking to him one-on-one -on -one and at least introducing myself and giving him my name. Um, every time you have an opportunity to put your name in front of someone who's important in the fashion industry, 
I ask you to do that because that in my career is something that I have prided myself on from the very beginning. Um, I think it's opened a lot of opportunities for me. I think it's opened a lot of doors that may have been closed otherwise. Um, and that's a really important part of this industry is getting your name into someone's head and really knowing who you are as a person, knowing who you are as a designer, as a merchandiser, as a salesperson, and getting your name out there so people start to recognize you. Um, after I worked for Dana, I actually did two seasons with John Bartlett. He was, uh, at that time, he was working for Jenny Group, which is in Italy, part of Biblos and that whole group. Um, he actually was the creative director at Biblos and had his women's wear and men's wear collection here in New York. I was actually employed by John to do um, some key looks for the runway, which was a great opportunity for me because, you know, the collection had pretty much already been designed at that point, and he asked me to come in, and he had a few concepts that weren't realized in the workroom in Italy, and he wanted me to actually realize those, those uh, ideas for him. So that was a great opportunity in that respect. And, you know, I worked for free. I wanted to get my name out there, again, to do something that was, that would put my name in his head. And, you know, when I, when I went to him and I, I showed him my portfolio, he said, well, you know, I, I think your portfolio is great. I really don't have any opportunities on a full-time basis. But, you know, if you wanted to, you could come in and help with a fashion show. So that one opportunity led to me working for him for two seasons. So those are the opportunities that you have to seize. I, I can't tell you how important those opportunities are. Um, when I, after I worked for John, um, I actually launched a small evening wear collection. My evening wear collection was priced between five to $10,000 at retail. Um, you know, a fantastic opportunity came about where I, I, was, able, I was able to do a um, virtual fashion show. I had a friend of a friend who had worked on Toy Story who actually gave me the opportunity to work with him and put together a virtual fashion show, which I marketed on the internet as well as in my showroom. I actually shared a space um, with Leela Rose, who's a up and coming designer right now. Um, I shared that sp showroom space with her. And during the week of September 11th, I actually had about 35 appointments in my showroom. Um, of course, Monday, my showroom opened, which was September 10th. And then the next day, everything definitely came to a halt. Um, you know, when I look back and I, I remember all those things that I went through, all those trials and tribulations that I went through to get to that point, it seems unbelievable that something like that could, could stop it right in its tracks. Um, but it did, and there's really nothing that I could do about it except to continue going. And that's another thing that this industry will teach you is that you must continue following your passion. If you have a goal in this, in this industry, I, I ask you to just continue to always push forward and go and go strong um, because it takes a lot of initiative. It takes a lot of drive to make these, these opportunities happen. Um, after September 11th, about four months later, I actually closed my showroom. Um, I ended up doing makeup for a company called Bourgeois, which is part of Chanel. I did makeup for them for about three months and was able to pay my rent and eat. So that was the most important thing at that point. Um, I don't know how many of you were here during September 11th, but after the events of September 11th, the fashion industry really came to a screeching halt. Um, there were no new job opportunities. A lot of my friends, a lot of my classmates lost their jobs, um, and there were just not that many opportunities to do things uh, in the industry. So, you know, it's another opportunity where you have to see how it works for you, you know. By being in New York, it's it's a tough environment, but if you if you have that passion, if you have that drive deep in your heart, you can continue and you can find a way to make it all happen. Um, after doing makeup for three or four months, I then started working for a private label company. Um, the private label company did uh, Saks Fifth Avenue's private label brand called Real Clothes. They also did um, J Jill. Um, we did Nordstrom, we did a lot of different brands, not the glamorous, fashionable lifestyle that I hoped to be living at that point, but again, it was something to make ends meet, it was something to pay my rent and to eat, you know. Um, so those opportunities came along and I 
really engulf myself in the idea that, okay, this is just a stepping stone. This is one of those opportunities that has come along that is going to mold me into what I need to be in the future. And, you know, looking back, it's like, okay, my first job out of FIT was with Dana Buckman. I sat in front of a computer, you know, eight to ten hours a day, and at that time I said, what does this all mean? You know, I, I went to school to be a designer. Why am I sitting here eight to ten hours a day on a computer working on line sheets? And I just thought it was pointless, but it wasn't. My next job at John Bartlett, I have to admit, that was a great job because I was able to be creative. I was able to really let my creativity show. But, you know, all of those things, they, they happen for a reason. And that really showed me the brighter, the bigger, the more exciting, and the more fashion-forward side of fashion. Um, and that's not always the truth of fashion. The truth of fashion is that you have to, you have to know who your consumer is. You have to really you know, understand who that person is, and that's what makes you a better designer. So that, that opportunity that I had with designing private label clothing for Nordstrom and Saks and J. Jill really showed me the mass market appeal of fashion. Um, after working that in those positions, I then decided that I wanted to move on up to the, you know, to a better level and to continue going and really still working towards getting back into my own label. Um, at that time, I was actually approached by Reba McIntyre, who started a collection for Dillard's. Um, Dillard's is 350 stores across the United States, more in the mainstream market, um, but again, I really wanted to learn and grow as a designer and understand all the different markets and determine where I would best be suited in my, you know, in my market, in my, under my label. Um, so I worked for Reba McIntyre for two years. Um, working for a celebrity was really interesting. Um, I got to fly on her private jet. I got to go shopping with her in Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills and, you know, hang out with her on the weekends, which was pretty cool. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I still knew what my true passion and my true gift was, and that was to create a, a line of clothing under my own name um, and that would appeal to an executive woman, a woman in the age range of 35 to 65, a woman who has a very strong sensibility, who understands cultural refinement, who really is um, a powerful woman. Um, and I think those sort of women, those baby boomer women who are out there, they have, an, they have a extreme amount of income, and it's usually their own money. They're not going to their husbands and saying, hey, honey, could I, you know, buy this $1,200 suit to wear, you know, to a party next week? They have their own money, and that's what I like about these women is they're powerful women who understand what fashion is and understand what they want and what they need. Um, so after working for Reba for two years, I started to kind of scout out amongst my friends, amongst my colleagues and my, my peers of, you know, who are people that I know who have the kind of money that I need to make my line happen. And I started talking to a lot of different people, uh, people that I'd worked with in the past, whether they be fabric people, um, factories that I knew in China, um, you know, colleagues of mine. And I said, you know, where did you get your money to start your lines? So. I actually found my first financial backers um, through one of the fabric mills that I used to work with at Dana. And I actually went to him and I said, you know, almost joking around about it, I said, you know, Ted, what would it take for us to start a line together? And he said, well, what would, what would it take? Well, how much money would you need? So I gave him a figure and he said, you know, okay, we could, we could work on that. Within two weeks, I gave my notice at, at Reba McIntyre, and I had started my own collection, just like that. And, you know, some of you might say, oh, well, you were lucky, but I don't think that way. I think that, you know, because you're, you always have to be in tune with your environment. You always have to be searching out, picking up little bits and pieces of what people might say here and there to understand what their capabilities are. Um, I mean, one of the biggest things I could tell you is if you ever have the opportunity to work with factories overseas, if you have the opportunity to work directly with fabric mills and things like that, pick their brain. Ask them, you know, have you ever backed a designer before? Have you ever, you know, thought about doing a clothing line? 
Um, I know that Philip Lim, who is a big, you know, he's a great success right now, his financial backer is also a fabric person, you know. So there's just plenty of opportunity out there. And as young designers, as your young merchandisers, you should really be thinking about that stuff. You know, don't always just think about what you have at the moment. Think about what's in the future and how these people can help you. Because they're always willing to help you. Um, I mean, I love, I love to help young talent and because, you know, people have helped me. Um, when I started the company, I went out to a lot of different retailers. Um, I went to Neiman Marcus in Westchester. I flew down to Atlanta where my family lives now. And I went to Neiman's and I went to Nordstrom's. I went to all these little boutiques all over the country, as many as I could find. And I asked the salespeople in these boutiques, what are you missing? You know, what, what kind of merchandise are you selling now? What kind of designers are you selling currently? And what do your customers ask for that they're not already getting? Um, and what I found is that there was really a void in the bridge market, and I say bridge because, you know, bridge in the fashion industry right now is a very dirty word. And we've off, we, we often say the word bridge, but I say it more in a way to fellow designers, to people in the industry who understand what bridge means. Basically, that is the price point between better and designer. It's not Banana Republic, and it's not Oscar de la Renta. It's that middle category. And um, there's, there's a new word for it, and it's called modern. And you'll see, like, if you go to Saks Fifth Avenue, they have their gold range sportswear now, which is that modern collections. Um, so anyway, I, I really saw that there was a void there. You know, you have the old standbys, you have the people that have been doing it for such a long time, but I feel like there's a new generation of consumers that are really searching for wearable clothing that's, you know, fashion forward, but also understandable. Women across the country, whether you're a CEO of a company, you're a stay-at-home mom who lunches in the afternoon, or who's a charity, you know, involved in charities, things like that. This, these are women who have a lot of power, who have a lot of, um, a lot of things going on in their, their environments that they need powerful clothing for. So I see that, there, I saw that there was this huge void in the market for that sort of clothing. And, you know, I, when I was here at FIT, I wanted to be an evening gown designer. And I, I thought that that was the, the best and most wonderful thing that I could do. And I still think that evening wear is a fantastic, you know, thing to get into, although there's just so few opportunities for it. Um, and I don't want to discourage anyone from following your dream at all, because at one time that was my dream. And who knows, if you think today that you might be an evening gown designer 10 years from now, you might be like me and five years later you realize, you know, this is not really what I want to do. Um, because I want to what I wanted to do was really to appeal to a, a large mass of people and really to be able to go out to stores and meet my customers and really understand what they need as consumers. Um, that is such an important part of starting your own company. And when I go to trunk shows, I will sit and I will talk to these women for hours sometimes. I mean, I have women that come to my trunk shows. They'll come the first day just to get a feel for the collection and then the next day they'll come and they'll spend two hours with me and we'll talk about their events that they need to go to, you know, their meetings that they have, the types of things that they do on a daily basis. And that really helps us as designers be much better at our job. Um, you know, visiting the stores that uh, you see your product in is also a very important part of being a good designer. Understanding who your competition is is another big part of it. Um, how many of you are actually design students? Okay. Um, you know, as a good designer, you should always know what your competition is doing. Um, I really think that we should all take an opportunity to go into the stores, look at what everyone around you is doing, and understand where you could fit into that. Because you don't need to be like everyone else. You have to set yourself apart. And although you know, each designer has your own look, your own appeal. You really have to know, as a marketing tool, how to set yourself apart. Um, so that is a very important part of what we do. Um, I also, you know, one of the biggest parts in fashion today is marketing. Um, if you find a very good angle of marketing yourself with the help of a good publicist like I have, you can really set yourself apart from the rest of the crowd. 
Um, that is very important to what we do, and um, I believe you know a lot of a lot of our a lot of our marketing that we do is directly to the consumer, which I think is also a great way to go. We don't do a lot of national advertising because at this point, honestly, we can't afford it. Um, but being two years in business, um, I can tell you that we've grown from 14 stores to almost 100 stores now. And every day we get new accounts, whether they're in Canada, San Francisco, Houston. You know, we have stores that carry our merchandise all over the country and Canada now. And so whatever we're doing, I believe we're doing it right. Um, and I think that's just a matter of setting yourself apart and letting yourself uh, be true to who you are. Um, right now I'm going to show you guys some slides of uh, the collections that we've done in the past. Um, and I'm going to talk you guys through it just to show you what you're seeing. This is from our fall collection. Uh, this is a tropical wool embroidered skirt. This is a silk satin jacket from our fall collection as well. Another medallion top, which is really pretty. This is one of our reversible jackets, which we do exceptionally well with at retail. It's one of our classic suitings. This is one of our evening gowns, which we do um, a lot of. We do a very lifestyle-driven collection. This is one of our spring looks. Another spring look with a ruffled burnout shirt detail. This is one of our die-cut leathers, which is really exceptionally beautiful. This is our silk and cotton trench. And this is from our current fall collection that are in this, this is in the stores now. This piece is actually doing really well for us. So you can see what we do is very classic in sensibility, but if you see the clothes in person, you'll see that there are a lot of details there that aren't just apparent in a photograph. Um, our fabrics are all Italian. 95% of what we do is Italian. Um, I go to Italy personally, and I, I design a lot of the fabrics that we use. Um, I have a good relationship with all of our fabric mills, and you know that's very important. Establish yourself as a good business person. Not only are you a designer, but you're also a business person. You know, you're, you're representing, whether you're representing yourself or you're representing another company, you should also always present yourself in a professional way. Um, I guess now I'll, I'll just take some questions if anyone has any questions. Yes. Go ahead. No, I actually got an associate's degree. Um, I was in school for five years, though. I, I went to uh, school for law. I was pre-law for three years, and then uh, got smart. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. You know, I, I think it depends on you as a person. I. Th I think your mom and dad are probably going to have a big say in what you do, but at the same time, when I came to school here, I'd, I'd had three years of, of pre-law and had actually set out for a year to save money to come to New York. And um, for me, you know, an associate's degree is what I needed because I already had a, a sensibility about what I wanted to do and how I needed to go about doing it. Um, I think. You know, if, if you start here when you're 18, I would say a bachelor's degree is perfect. I mean, you know, I, 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 think, I think by the time that you're 21, you really know what you want to do. At least I, I knew what I wanted to do at that time. So for me, it was the perfect, you know, situation. But it really just depends on the person. Anyone else? Yes. Well, you know, the company right now, we're, we're in a huge growth spurt. Um, you know, most companies, when the, in the first two to three years, that's really the trying time. That's when you figure out, okay, is this actually going to make it? You know, are we going to get it off the ground? Is it going to have a continued momentum? And so far, from the first season 
of 14 stores to now, which is almost 100 stores, we just continue to grow. And honestly, um, I think within the next five years, I'd like to see us in 150 to 200 specialty shops and then a major department store. And we're actually in talks with Neiman Marcus right now. We've been talking to them for the last three seasons. Um, you know, a major department store is a huge undertaking. It's, um, it's not only the financial aspect of things, but it's also, um, you know, logistically, how do you actually fulfill those orders? That's another thing. You know, you can be the best designer in the world, but unless you can fulfill orders and get your merchandise on, into the stores on time, then it's pointless. Yes. OK. Well, I actually, um, I'm in a multi-line showroom in Dallas, and um, his name is Nat Eckelman. And Nat has a very good relationship with Neiman's. He's been selling to them for 25 years. He also represents Escada, Missoni, uh, Luis de Serrano from Germany. So he has a lot of lines that are already in Neiman's. Um, so that always helps. Um, also, I have uh, my new sales team. I, I put together um, a really great team in my New York office, and um, my VP of sales right now is a lady who was at Nicole Fari North America, and she also has a really good relationship with Neiman's. So, you know, getting your foot in the door, it's usually done the best way is to have someone who knows them, who's done bin business with them already, and that could be through a multi-line showroom. That's another thing I should mention, like multi-line showrooms and, you know, I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, but multi-line showrooms in New York are very, very difficult. It's very difficult to find your home in a multi-line showroom in New York. Um, if you find your right home, it could be the best thing in the world. But, you know, for the most part, I would say, you know, just having someone to work with you on an individual basis and representing your company and only representing you is the better way to go. So. Actually, the first time they saw it was in um, our Dallas showroom, and that's a that's a multi-line showroom in Dallas, and they actually they walk that showroom every single market. Uh, so they came in, and we we set up an opportunity for them to see it. Um, and but they've been in my New York showroom many times, um, and you know it just depends. What, what do you, you know? What do you call a showroom? You could have a small space, which is actually you know your friends, you know office where they have you know their five things that they do or whatever and you could turn it into your showroom overnight if you needed to you know um, but if you find the right buyers um, they're always willing to to see young designers um, when I had my evening gown collection I actually had no sales rep um, I honestly don't even think I knew what a, a, a multi-line sales rep was at that point. <laughs> and I actually just did it all on my own. And, you know, during the week of September 11th, I had almost 35 appointments. And that was just by getting on the phone, pounding the phone. Like, I mean, you have to call these people, like, every single week. And if you think you're being annoying, who cares? Be annoying. <laughs> but it is. It's really important because, honestly, after they hear your name so many times, they're like, gosh, that annoying guy, Hilton Hollis, he keeps calling me. Maybe I should talk to him. So he'll stop calling me. You know, and they will. They'll talk to you eventually. I had Robert Verdi from Full Frontal, Full Frontal Fashion. I saw him at 7th on 6th. I had I'd actually called him on the phone like 20 times. And I went up to him at 7th on 6th and I said, hey, Robert, I'm Hilton Hollis. And he's like, oh, God, you're that annoying guy who calls me all the time. <laughs> but do you know that he set, a, he set a camera crew, sent a camera crew like the next day to my showroom to film it. So, you know, persistence, it, it, it pays, definitely. Yes? Um, honestly, it's according to how much money your backer has. <laughs> You know, in the very beginning, I did it all on my own. Honestly, I, I had, I had a, you know, my, my situation was very unique in that I had a factory in Hong Kong that I'd done business with, with some of my previous jobs, and she believed enough in me to do some samples for me in the very beginning for free. 
So I was able to do like, you know, I did a 35 piece collection and she did the samples. I did all the sketches. I did all the specs. I ordered all the fabrics. I tracked the fabrics. I got them in the factory in Hong Kong. She sent me the samples and then I started selling it. I started selling it. <sighs> Honestly, I think there's just a lot of different ways you can look at it. You can start with just yourself. Or if you know your financial backers say to you, hey, I've got a million dollars to invest, I would say you need at least two people, at least. You know, two people on your staff, like yourself and your assistant, and then someone working on the sales force. Because really, my, although I started my collection with 14 stores, the collection really didn't become so important and such a, you know, it didn't, it wasn't, you know, so much of a huge undertaking that I couldn't handle it myself until the second season. And then that's really when it really started to get crazy because, you know, they wanted three deliveries per season and, you know, you, you have to have the manpower to do that. Again, I think that's a matter of, you know, how much money do you have to invest in it in the beginning? For me personally, I would love to have a store, um, but I know that, I know that, you know, financially, we are not going to be in a position to do that for at least seven years out. Um, and I think that's really the smart way to do it is, you know, you have to start to build your name. You can't just set up a store and expect to become successful overnight. You know, building is the key to anything. Um, and getting your name out there, getting some exposure, you know, and there's a lot of stores out there. There are new stores every single day um, that pop up and, you know, I learn of new stores every single day. Um, so just getting out there, fi figuring out what type of store you want to be in, put your merchandise in there, go in, see how it sells, you know, let that be the determining factor of what steps you need to take next, you know. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you oh, is there another one? Yeah. Okay. Um, I could give you 35 factories, <laughs> but it's just a matter of what you need to have made, what type of volume we're looking at. I mean. The thing is, is with, when you're dealing with factories overseas, they usually have a very strict policy of what they will accept as an order, and that's very limiting. You know, in the beginning, for someone who doesn't have a good relationship with a factory overseas, it's always good to start here in, in the U.S. Um, produ production costs are much higher here, but they'll do small minimums, which is also good. Yes. Actually, the first collection, do you mean like my customer or the true inspiration for the collection? Okay. Um, basically, the, the first collection was inspired by uh, Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec, and it was all about the Moulin Rouge and very can-can uh, inspired. Um, it was 12 pieces, you know, we hung them from uh, mannequins from a ceiling in my showroom and um, I had, you know, customers come in and really the first collection that I did, um, it, was, it was really about garnering some support from, you know, high-end clientele and, and starting a private client business. And then that second collection is my true collection where I came out, which was like September 10th, so, yes. Um, you mean as far as like not letting anyone else see what I'm doing or? Right. I mean, honestly, I, I had a situation like that occur and it was, 
it was very uh, disheartening. I, I actually had uh, one of my bustiers that I had done. It was like a sheared silk chiffon, like crinkle silk chiffon. Had this beautiful beaded strap that was all hand beaded. And when I got the sample back, I realized that half of the beads were missing off the back of the strap. So someone had obviously taken you know, my beading concept. They probably took pictures of it, and they sent it off to a factory somewhere to be reproduced. And really, I mean, the only thing that you can do to protect yourself in that situation is either hand carry your garments and refuse to let them, you know, stay there overnight, which is sometimes hard, especially, you know, the bigger you get, the harder it is to control that sort of thing. Um, in the beginning, you as the designer, if you're going to be also representing yourself as the salesperson, you can easily say to them, you know, I'd really love for you to see my collection, but I'd like to show it to you desk side, like at your desk. And, but I, I can't leave you the samples, you know? And I mean, it's as simple as that, but you, you kind of, you know, you risk for someone else not being able to see it also. Because what if they say to you, oh, well, my boss is out today. I'd really love him, for him to see it. You could also, you could say, well, you know, when's your boss gonna be in? I could bring it back to you. Or you could run the risk of, you know, having them do, so. you know, hopefully there aren't that many people like that in the industry. <laughs> I'd like to think that at least. What's that? It is. You're right. You know, it, it, it all balances out in the end. Um, I, I think as designers, if we do good things for people and we give good positive energy out, you're going to get a lot of positive energy back. Um, so do good and you'll receive good in return. Yes. No, I actually, I, I do know how to make patterns, but at this point, I, I, I don't know how I would even start. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my evening gown collection that I had, um, I made all the patterns for that. So, you know, that was, that was in the very beginning. That was when it was fresh in my mind. Um, I'm sure I could sit down and make a pattern. And of course, here we have pattern making right here. <laughs> Who would probably say to me, you need to learn patterns again. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I don't make my patterns now. But like I said, if, if I took a quick glance in a textbook, I could definitely draft a pattern, I'm sure, very quickly. So. We do about 350 pieces, so it would be pretty hard for me to actually draft all the patterns. <laughs> I, I actually, my publicist is here in the front row, Deborah Sullivan. Um, Deborah worked for Ralph Lauren for a number of years, for I believe 12 years. 12 years, she worked for Shaken. Um, and what I did is I went a little bit of a different route. I decided that I didn't want to go with a big firm. A lot of times, young designers especially get lost. I mean, I actually spoke to a firm before I met Deborah who represented DKNY. They represented a lot of new and upcoming designers. And I said to myself, okay, what makes me so special to these people that they're not going to promote someone else before they'll spend the time to promote me? You know, and I just think it's very important that you meet someone who you gel well with, um, who you kind of have a good rapport with, and who really believes in what you do. Um, because I, I, you know, I met plenty of PR people who said, "Oh yeah, great, we'll we'll take you on board. We love what you do, and yeah, you can pay the X amount of dollars per month." But at the end of the day, the person who represents you has to be a part of what you believe in. You know, they have to really believe in you and you have to believe in them so that's the most most important thing as far as pr is concerned anything else um i don't i mean i i think as long as you can convey your 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 ideas on paper that's the most important part um you know i hire illustrators to do illustrations for me at this point um, I'm not the best illustrator. I can tell you right now that when I started FIT, I was horrible. Like, I think what got me into this school was my sewing skills, because I started sewing when I was eight years old. So n I couldn't put things necessarily on paper in a good way, but I could realize them on a dress form and I could sew them perfectly and like, you know, make a beautiful gown, like whatever you wanted, I could make it. But as far as illustrating, I was never really good at it. Um, when I graduated, I thought, wow, I actually can sketch now, you know? So, I mean, it's important, but more, more or less just being able to get your ideas on paper is what really matters. Yes? I have... 
No, I actually have five people right now. Um, it's myself. I have my VP of sales, who is uh, from Nicole Fari. I have uh, my associate designer. I have a production associate, and then I have my bookkeeper. Um, you know, again, I was, I'm in a very good situation where my financial partner, one of my financial partners, is a doctor. So he has his entire financial accounting, you know, department in the hospital that he owns. And they do all of my financials for me, except for like the immediate, immediate bookkeeping. So, you know, basically all my bookkeeper does is enter invoices and they pay them at our financial office. So, but like I said, you, you never know who's going to be your financial partner. So just keep your eyes and ears open and, you know, you can always find someone. And one, one person who you start with might not be who you end up with two years later. Because my original financial partner, he was actually bought out by my factory in Hong Kong. Because once the orders started rolling in, my factory in Hong Kong said, ooh, you know, I want to I wanna invest. Where, how can I get in? So he made a nice chunk of change when he sold out. So anything else? Um, I think computers are very important to what we do. Um, I don't think it'll ever, it, it's never going to take the place of um, illustrating or hand drawing or being able to draw details by hand. I mean, that's the fun of what we do, I think. Um, and it, it really, again, it's according to the type of design that you go into. I think in the activewear area, uh, things that are more, um, they're more like, you know, athletic, things like that. I think that's important to be able to um, to put specs on you know garments in that way. But when you talk about high fashion, when you talk about collections and the avant-garde, part of the art of fashion is to be able to draw something beautiful or to be able to realize something beautiful on a form. Um, you know, I feel like we're artists, we're sculptors. We you know, there's a fluidity, there's a 3D kind of you know love to what we do. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. For me, I a lot of what we do is I'll see an idea, whether it's like the way an umbrella, like I had this weird idea the other day that was like, I was on the train and there was this lady beside me and she had this umbrella and the way the fabric was wrapped around the umbrella at the top, the way it had the folds like this, you know, I was like, how could that, that's such a cool shape, you know, how could that be interpreted into like a collar? So I had my associate designer go to the dress form and I actually went to a trunk show down in Memphis and when I came back, I walked in and there was this beautiful collar on the dress form and it was that umbrella. You know, so it just depends on, on what the concept is. I mean, if it's a button detail or something very simple like that, I usually just sketch it out. Um, but if it's something that really has to be draped and molded and felt on the form, then, you know, of course, we go to it with fabric and do our thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, our collection is, is very unique in that we, we do a lot of uh, fabric seaming and um, details that are done by hand that would typically be done in any other situation by machine at this level. Um, but I really pride myself in being very, I, I don't want to say the warm word homespun because when I think of homespun, I think of like Project Alabama. You know, like it's very like earthy, it's very like, you know, um, very homespun. <laughs> but um, for me, it's more about like the seaming and the piecing of fabrics. Um, my grandmother was a quilt maker. So um, I wish you could see like some of the details in my jackets. I do a lot of back details on jackets where, you know, a lot of designers, we always focus on the front. But I do a lot of things that are interesting on the back because I feel like, you know, women need to make a, a good impression. Exactly. Women need to make a good impression when they're entering a room and when then they're leaving a room. Because you remember, you, you know, the last moment when you see someone leaving a room, you look at, hey, that's a great back detail. And you, in your mind, you think, oh, 
she's got great taste. She's got great style. So, anything else? Thank you.